Allied troops sweep onwards towards Paris. A three-word announcement from the capital brings the great news, Paris is liberated. Cheering crowds line the streets as the Allies speed through the outskirts. The Union Jack flies beside those other flags that have been forbidden for four long years of Nazi rule. At the spearhead of the advance is General Leclerc's French 2nd Armored Division. And well in the picture are men of the FFI, whose comrades inside the city have helped to force the swaggering Germans to surrender. No wonder these French folk have gone wild with joy. Refugees who left Paris when street fighting flared up wait with their belongings to return to the city. A great moment arrives when General de Gaulle, who has stood as the symbol of free France through the dark years, sets foot in Paris again. General Leclerc, who led his 2nd French Division into the city, is also received with great enthusiasm. And there's a special welcome for General Koenig, head of the French forces of the interior, whose activities have caused Hitler so many sleepless nights. But Paris has not yet seen its last violence. True to their reputation for treachery, the Germans have broken their word to cease fighting and have established strong points from which to challenge the advancing Allies. But these suicide squads are mopped up in the style of Eisenhower's liberators. Onwards into Paris itself. In the background, above the other landmarks, can be seen the noble building of the Invalides, famous for the imposing tomb of Napoleon. And here, no longer strutting supermen, are some Nazi prisoners who decided they would sooner live than die for Hitler. Here is another Nazi strong point, this time a tank that has gone up in smoke. of plane exploring ahead of the troops shows us the scene in one of the wide boulevards below. There's still some shooting going on down there, but the nuisance value of the Nazi fanatics hasn't much longer to run. Here is the famous Eiffel Tower and some more of the master race whose dreams of world domination have come unstuck. German snipers are still making things hot in one or two places, but tank guns and rifle fire from the FFI and Allied soldiers are quick to reply wherever concealed gunmen lurk. Here's what a couple of men with fixed bayonets would like to do to Hitler and Goering. They've got the right idea. More trouble from Nazi snipers. But the Parisians have an answer to this sort of thing. Once more the cry goes up, as it has before in Paris's history, to the barricades. And then, as the victorious troops arrive, men, women, and children tear aside the barriers to let the Allied armor through. the feelings of the French themselves at the tremendous news. Here is an authoritative voice, an official broadcaster of the French delegation in London. Speaking as a Frenchman with the feelings that only a Frenchman can have for his native land, I too feel the joy of these Parisians of their southern liberation after four years under Nazi heel. But before joy, there comes a solemn feeling of gratitude and dedication towards those who have given their lives in the fight against the invader. When General de Gaulle paid homage at the tomb of the unknown warrior, the thought of all must have turned to those French men and women of the resistance, soldiers and civilians, who during the present struggle have paid with their lives for defying the oppressor.
crowd swarmed the famous after triumph, determined not to miss a moment of this great day in their city's history. When these pictures were taken by our Kenneth Gordon, member of a small army of newsreel and service cameramen, the first staccato rattle of an assassin's gun aimed at General de Gaulle had already startled the crowd. As General de Gaulle made his way through the wildly cheering crowds along the Saint Elysee, he must have been deeply moved. For to a Frenchman, Paris is not just the capital city, hardly great. It is the very heart of all he holds dear. And after four long years, that heart was beating free again. Once more, Paris stood as he had done throughout the centuries, as the living symbol of freedom. by sporadic outbursts of firing from a hidden enemy and retaliating fusillades from protecting rifles, General de Gaulle drives down the Rue de Rivoli towards the Hotel de Ville and Notre Dame. What strikes me in this liberation of Paris is the mixture, the unbelievable mixture of fighting and rejoicing, of songs and shots, of delirious crowds and tanks, and also the intimate participation of the people of Paris in the liberation of their city. The war in Paris was Paris' business as much as the defiance of the enemy, as much as the songs of liberation. Parties of Red Cross workers and first aid detachments are to be seen here and there, working heroically in this confused but unforgettable scene. Every now and then a Red Cross flag is waved from points in this amazing battleground. People fling themselves full length to escape the flying bullets. Shooters stationed in window vantage points are blasted from their hideouts. An ugly situation is met by the resolute counterfire from the French armoured columns. In all, five attempts on the life of General de Gaulle were made. threatened to lynch captured prisoners. French police hustled the snipers through the iron gates of the Hotel de Ville. The temper of the Parisians on this 20th century Bastille Day is no light thing. Travel back now across the Seine in the direction of the Champs-Élysées and see and hear the tumultuous reception given to the French, British and American fighting men.
him in four bitter years, Paris indulges in an almost forgotten emotion, the experience of happiness, the city of light and gaiety has been rid of its long term of darkness. Long live Paris. Thank you.